I was talking to the students of UCLA last year, and someone in the audience heckled or asked a question. He said, how was Joan in the belly of the whale for three days? I said, I haven't the vaguest idea. But when I get to heaven, I shall ask Jonah. He said, well, suppose Joan isn't there. Well, I said, then you ask him. <laughs> now, this has to be a special talk tonight. Therefore, I will not be like the professor who traveled about this country in motor car and chauffeur always giving the same lecture. One day the chauffeur said to him, I think I've heard that lecture of yours a thousand times, and I could give it just as well as you do. All right, said the professor. You stand up on the platform tonight, give the lecture. I will sit out in the audience in your chauffeur's uniform. The chauffeur gave a perfect lecture. But at the end, Hand went up. There's a question I would like to ask you. When you mix that H2SO4 with that NaCl2 and compare it with the photographic plates of the sun, how do you get the equation E equals M over C squared? He said, that's the most stupid question I ever heard in all my life. And to show you how stupid it is, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to answer it. And I was lecturing in upstate New York and went into a barber shop in the afternoon. The barber did not recognize me. He said, are you going to that lecture tonight by Bishop Sheen? Yes. He said, do you have a ticket? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, all the tickets have been sold. You probably will have to stand. I said, you know, it's a peculiar thing. Every time I go to hear that man talk, I always have to stand. <laughs> Now, you have no idea, not the least idea, of when I am going to finish. Because I have no papers, and there's no way of indicating it. I can't see you very well either in these blinding lights, so I can't tell when you go to sleep. <laughs> now, one of the reasons that I don't use papers is I once heard a preacher preaching a sermon, and he had... He finished the first page. Adam said to Eve, and he turned over the next. Adam said to Eve, Adam said to Eve, there must be a leaf missing. <laughs> and I once heard, I once heard an Irish woman say of a bishop who was reading a speech, glory be to God if he can't remember it, how does he expect us to? Have you noticed that it is only within the last 50 years that we ever had to use the words right to life? All peoples have universally believed in the life. Life and its right. Code of Hammurabi, centuries before Christ, believed in it. So something has changed. Now, behind every single movement is a philosophy. You see, I'm a philosopher, so I'm not going to speak to you as a medic. I'm not going to speak to you as a lawyer, but as a philosopher. And everyone has a philosophy of life. G.K. Chesterton said, when you sit down in a dentist's chair, that dentist has a right to ask you, what is your philosophy of life? Because if your philosophy of life is wrong, he can't be sure you'll ever pay your bill. So everyone has a philosophy of life. Now, what is the philosophy of life behind abortion? That's what we're going to inquire into first. Let me give you some examples of philosophies of life. For example, when the Nazis said that the Nordics were the chosen race and others were unfit 
to live in the nation. From that point on, you just could not stop the killing of the Jews because the philosophy was wrong. In Russia, the basic philosophy is the party alone matters. Well, just as soon as an individual disagrees with the party, he's sent to an insane asylum and declared mad. Take the Christian philosophy of life. Certain consequences follow from this. A friend of mine who had spent seven years in the communist prison and was originally a Jewess, she became a Christian. One day before the communists came into Romania, her country, a Nazi called on her husband, who was also a Jew, and later became a Christian. And he said to the Nazi, how many Jews have you killed the last few weeks? Oh, he said 25,000. In this particular village, how many did you kill? I killed everyone in that town. The man said, did you, do you ever ask God for forgiveness? Oh, he says, God doesn't exist. There isn't any such thing as forgiveness. All right said the husband. My wife is upstairs asleep. She's not heard this conversation. I'm going to ask her to come down. When she appeared before them, my friend said to his wife, Sabina, this is the man who kills your father, your mother, your three brothers and two sisters. She looked at him for a moment and threw her arms around him kissed him and said, as God forgives you, I forgive you. That forgiveness was the consequence of a Christian philosophy. Now, what is the philosophy behind abortion? That is to say, what is the set of values that determines the destruction of life? The philosophy behind the destruction of life is a misunderstanding of freedom and a misunderstanding of love. First of all, they understand freedom as the right to do whatever you please. We hear the young people say it today, for example, oh, I gotta be me. I gotta do my thing. I gotta be free. Nobody's going to stop me. There's an absolute denial of limits. The selfish ego determines its own, denies all limits, and regards any law as a restriction of freedom. Well, once you admit freedom as the right to do whatever you please, then look at the consequences. You can turn a machine gun on your neighbor's chickens. You can stuff Aunt Lizzie's mattress with old razor blades. The only stopping to doing whatever you please is power. And believe me, if we in America are going to develop this philosophy of doing whatever you please, there's going to be a reaction. And the reaction already has taken prisoner one-third of the people of the world, that's communism, which says, no, freedom is the right to do whatever you must. We say freedom is the right to do whatever you want. But once that philosophy is proclaimed, that the ego is supreme, there are no limits, then abortion follows. I wonder when we ever got into this position of denying limits. I wonder why our young people are so concerned with their identity. Thirty or forty years ago, nobody had the problem of identity. Why not? Because he recognized boundaries, limits. How do you know the limits, for example, of the, the identity of the state of Illinois? By its boundary lines. How do you know the identity of a basketball court? By its foul lines. How do we know our own identity? By limits, by boundaries, by law, by order. And I think we lost all of these at 8.15 in the morning 
August the 6th, 1945, when we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. That bomb blotted out boundaries of life and death, civilian and the military, and trust among nations. And so abortion, from that point on, is defended on the ground that one may do whatever he pleases. That's the first false philosophy. The second is a misunderstanding of love. They understand love as an experience. Love is sex. And it doesn't make very much difference who the other person is. The fig leaf that in Greek sculpture was over the secret parts of man and woman is today put over the face. They don't care who gives them the exhilaration. It is only the experience itself that matters. The person does not count. You drink the water, you forget the glass. This is not the meaning of love. Love is reciprocal. It involves persons. And love also involves responsibility. And one of the reasons, the principal reason why there is abortion today is women are saying, well, I don't want to have myself disturbed. I don't want to care. I want no burden. I want to do whatever I please. I want to love myself. This is the philosophy. Now, with the result that America is being divided into two classes, biophilics and necrophilics. Now we're going to enjoy a little bit of Greek. Before I came on the stage, I asked the bishop how many people in the audience did he think had forgotten their classical Greek, and he said, not over eight. Well, for the benefit of those eight, I will have to tell you the meaning of these words. In Greek, bios is life, and philia is love. Hence, the biophilic people are those who love life. Necros, in Greek, is corpse. Philia is love. The people of America and the world are being divided into two classes into the biophilics who love life, the necrophilics who love death. The biophilics love life. And why? Because at the beginning, God made this constellation of heaven. And that's the way Genesis describes it. God made, God said, until we come to man. Then, for the first time, we hear, as it were, the trinity of persons entering into council and saying, let us make man, because man was to be made to the divine image. The biophilics start there. They believe that God is the originator of life. And that is why they are impatient with those who say, oh, you don't know whether it's going to be human or not. Wait for three months, wait for six months. Is that true? Listen, the problem is not when human life begins. The problem is who made it? Who produced it? Lilies make lilies. Elephants make elephants. Human persons make human persons. You put, for example, Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto Number 1 on a record, or Beethoven's Leonore. If you know music, as soon as you hear 
the first few notes, you know what it's going to be. The next half hour of that symphony will unfold just as you may predict. There are no musicians in that machine. There are no notes written on the tape. But it's all there from the very beginning. And just as soon as a husband and wife do the procreative act, there can be from the very beginning life. And that whole life is structured, written out, just as clearly to be human as the notes were written to be either, say, a Tchaikovsky or a Beethoven. The reason we are defending life, as I will show in a moment, is because there's a clock to life. And we're afraid of that clock unwinding. Nor is it true that love alone decides whether life is wanted. Remember the famous scene in the courtroom of Solomon? Two prostitutes had children. During the night, one of the prostitutes rolled over on her baby and smothered it. The other prostitute took the dead baby and put it alongside of the other woman and kept the other child, the live one, for herself. In the morning, the real mother was accused of having killed her own babe. The case went to Solomon. Now, remember, both of these women wanted children. They had love for their children. That was not primary. Solomon said, bring the live child. Give me a sword. And he took the sword and he said, I will cut this babe in two. I will give half to you and half to you. One of the women cried out, no, give her the other babe. Solomon said, you're the mother. And why was she the mother? Because she loved life. Life came before anything else. So we are biophilics. And the others are becoming necrophilics, the lovers of death. There is a killing of a young life by abortion every 20 seconds in the United States. There are as many babes killed by abortion in nine days in the United States as men were killed in nine years in the Vietnam War. One half of all the babes that take life in a mother's womb in Washington, D.C., are mugged. Their life is taken from them. In New York City, out of every ten children that are in the mother's womb, Five are destroyed. We are becoming a civilization of death, and that is why. Notice the type of movies that appear today. The Towering Inferno, the earthquake, television, violence, destruction. Why is it that we love, live in an age of destructiveness and violence? It's simply because people have no interior life, they're not creating anything within themselves, and they're not creating human life. They're aborting it. And instead of creating life now by violence, they go out and destroy it. And that's why that, that type of picture is produced. Freud was not so wrong. When he spoke of eros thanatos, here we get into Greek again. Eros love, not the highest kind of love. Eros 
Thanatos, T-H-A-N-A-T-O-S. Thanatos was death. Freud said, the sex given over wholly to satisfaction becomes abnormally interested in the death instinct. And that is what is happening today. During the Victorian days, sex was taboo. Today, death is taboo. You are not to speak about it. And so they use other words. Just like the communists would use the word liberation when they take over a country, so today it is said that a mother has a fetus. Who ever heard of a mother having a fetus? The mother is always with child. And that is just the kind of a, of a verbal escape from admitting that there is life within. That brings me to the rapid progress toward death in our American culture. There was a woman who had been at Auschwitz, and every woman and man who was at Auschwitz had a number written on the arm. She went to a doctor. The doctor says, I can take off that tattoo. She said, I don't want it taken off. She said, I don't know where you learned life, doctor, but I know where I learned it, in Auschwitz. And after having been through it, I wouldn't step on a cockroach. That was her respect for life. But once you begin to make a law, and remember that legality is not morality, because the Supreme Court makes something legal, it does not necessarily make it moral. Whoever thought, for example, when the Reichstag passed its first law on Nordic supremacy, that there would be six million Jews incinerated in Belsen, Dachau, Auschwitz, and other torturous and horrendous prisons of Germany. But once you begin to give way, then there comes a very rapid decline. If you put a frog, for example, in a large bowl of water and make that water the normal, healthy temperature for a frog, and you heat that water, imperceptibly, the smallest degree every day, eventually it will boil. You cannot point to one single day when that frog struggled against hot water. Death took it over so gradually that it almost seemed to be normal. And so a country that's given to death can imperceptibly sink and sink and sink until it brings us to the clock, which I will speak in a moment. If we go on with this disrespect for life, we may eventually pass a threshold where our nature will change. If you cool oxygen to 100 degrees minus zero centigrade, even at that freezing temperature, it still remains a gas. If, however, you lower it to 180 degrees below zero centigrade, the gas turns into a liquid. Its nature changed. It passed a threshold. 
And if we become a life-destroying culture, our nature may change. And then the clock will go on ticking and ticking. I wanted to look at my clock to see how long I've been talking. I've been talking 30 minutes. And it's, I told you I was going to tell you about the clock. It's, that's the reason I look at it. You know, it's always better to have a speaker, have an audience say, I wish he'd talk longer than to have them say he had three good chances to quit. <laughs> I heard of an Irish family that moved from Dublin to Boston, and one of the sons migrated to Chicago. The father died in Boston. The brother in Boston, Chicago, sent a wire to his brother in Boston asking, what were father's last words? The answer came back, father had no last words, mother was with him to the end. All right, now thus far I have told you that many in our population are necrophilic, lovers of death. That is very serious. So in fighting for the right to life, We are also fighting for America. Because believe me, as our Lord said, don't believe me, believe what our Lord said. Our Lord, <laughs> our Lord said, wherever the carcass is, there the vultures shall gather together. Out from mountain fastnesses they come at the first sight of corrupting flesh. And our Lord was then speaking of a culture and a civilization for within a generation Vespasian and Titus came to Jerusalem and nothing fell like that since Satan fell from heaven. So the presence of cadavers and there is a presence of them one sore pipe in a hospital in Los Angeles was clogged with a hundred human beings. That's necrophilism in a city. But now the clock. I want you to picture a great and gigantic clock of life. Here is dawn, morning. Here is noon, here is dusk, six o'clock in the evening, here is midnight. The clock of life at the very beginning of the day is beginning to extinguish life. Set aside the killing of human persons in the womb. That's the first stroke of the clock. Then we come to noon. Lives in middle age. We've already had this strike. Six million Jews burned by Hitler. Life at the beginning, life at noon. Life in the evening. Now euthanasia is recommended. Gerocide, the killing of the old. In fact, three American professors in large universities have recommended killing off of Bangladesh and India. 
that the rest of us may survive. Now, what's going to happen to a world that takes life at dawn, life at noon, life at dusk? We're eventually going to come to midnight. The United States and Russia have enough nuclear armaments to drop ten tons of TNT on every man, woman, and child in the world. That's the midnight of necrophilism. In the last century, Jean Coeur, a publisher, was visited by Claude Bernard and Emil Boutroux two of the famous scientists of their times. And Boutroux said to Jean Coeur, we have just begun to list the alphabet of destruction. And in the next century we will have completed it. And Jean Coeur said, and when that day comes, I think God will come down from heaven like a night watchman, rattling his keys, And he will say, gentlemen, it's closing time. And then we will have to start all over again. On the 11th of February, two years before the explosion of the first nuclear bomb in New Mexico, Pius XII gave the exact explosive power of one ounce of uranium. Atomic scientists, they said they were surprised how he knew it. And he said, I hope that this is always used peacefully. But if it is not, it will bring great harm in those places where it is used and eventually to the planet itself. So you see, my good people, it's not just life at dawn we're protecting, it's life at noon, it's life at dusk, it's life at midnight. And those who have lived close to life. Understand this. Many a poor girl that has aborted a child has felt that horror all the rest of her days. As a poet put it, your cruelest pain is when all the honeyed treasure of your body is spent and no new life to show. Then you understand why people lift their hands against themselves and taste the bitterest of all punishment whom pleasure isolates. When darkness gives vision scope and you lie awake at night, you see the pale, sad faces of the little ones with their cheeks pressed against your window, looking in, poor, famished babes, denied your wombs and bosoms. In one such story, I will read you a part of the long letter from a girl in Long Island. But let me give you a real and a hypothetical case about the destruction of life. The mother is tubercular. The father is syphilitic. The first child was born and lived. Second one died shortly after birth. The third was deaf and dumb. The fourth was tubercular. The woman was pregnant, 
and about to bring forth a child. Should she have aborted? This is a real case. She would have killed Beethoven. A second case. There's overpopulation, crowding, poor housing, in fact, no housing, poverty, and a shame about a father that is not named. Should that woman have aborted? That was Mary. She would have killed Christ. Now, from the letter from this girl, I will just read you passages from it. Please listen to my plea. What I have to say cannot be found in pro-life rallies and newspaper reports, nor medical accounts of statistics against abortion. What I have to say will hopefully be of value to you, which is one of my basic reasons for writing. My decision to have an abortion was by no means quick. I knew down deeply I was wrong but gave in to my selfishness and chose my own well-being to my babies. I rationalized that I could make it half right by doing it in my own way. I received a saline shot and went home instead of remaining at the hospital. I wanted to be alone at the moment of my baby's death. I went to a motel and anxiously awaited for labor to begin. Throughout the labor, I was able to think of nothing but the physical pain at hand. Then there was a tiny baby girl with me. Death. The shock and hurt of holding your own self-destroyed child is not describable in words. But by choice, I wanted a moment alone with my baby for a chance to say I'm sorry. But when the time came, how inadequate and how foolish the words sounded. A garbage pail wasn't good enough for my baby, so I chose a soft bed. Then I was all alone. With all the months of indecision and all the realization, the fear, physical, psychological anguish, and my own dead baby. I was torn with the thought of why didn't I wait three months more? and my baby would be able to love me back. All the things I should have thought of before were only thought of at that moment. I stayed with my dead baby for several days, not able to leave her, not realizing that the very day I even doubted having her, I left her and all I ever stood for. I buried my baby and have been working since then toward redirecting my life, and I hope for some purpose. As selfish people, we tend to react more to what will happen to us in this life and ignore belief in eternal life. But an everyday hell of mine can now be pointed out, never hearing a baby cry without crying within yourself counting days to see how old your baby would have been. 
watching the sunrise without thinking, my baby will never experience this. Looking at other children and wondering, what would my baby look like? Wondering what contributions my baby could have made to our desperate society. Wondering if my baby will ever forgive me. Wonder if my baby listens when I speak to her. Wonder if I'll ever have another chance at motherhood. Who will blackball me? Wondering if God will ever forgive and take me back. Wondering if one can ever again participate in a church service without feeling self-hate and hypocritical. And all this deserved hell I faced. In conclusion, then, In the early days of Christianity, Herod waited until the babe, babes were two months old. And then about 31 years later, another life was taken, an innocent life. He had a cross put upon his shoulders, carried it up the rocky heights of Golgotha, looked out upon a temple whose rays were reflecting itself against the sun, about to hide its face in shame. Round about were mockers, but also a penitent Magdalene and a mother who's hated to see life taken from her child. And John, who understood that life and divine life as well as anyone except the woman and he who was on the cross. And from that cross, divine life said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive who? Forgive the doctors who take a life in the dark. Forgive the hospitals who become a party to the party of the necrophilics. Forgive the nurses who are sickened at the sight but still go on. Forgive particularly the doctors who get money for it and to make us feel some fear that if they were paid the same amount for taking off one of our fingers, I wonder if we could save our fingers. Forgive the women who cooperated with the death and the men too. Not because they're smart, but because they're ignorant. And if they ever come to him who is on that cross, they will find their forgiveness. But they must come and they must ask. For whenever there's silence round about me by day or night, I am startled by a cry. It came down from the cross the first time I heard it, and I went out and searched, and found a man in the throes of crucifixion. And I said, I will take you down, and I tried to take the nails out of his feet, but he said, let them be. For I cannot be taken down until every man, woman, and child come together to take me down. But I said, what can I do? I cannot bear your cry. And he said, go into the world and tell everyone that you meet 
There is a life in the womb. God loves